what I'm presenting as a, as a first thing is an installation that I've done in Tallinn, in the capital of Estonia, in 2015. Um, it's, a, it's a video projection on a building. It was, um, uh, I was there because there was a light festival and there were artists from uh, mostly Europe and uh, I was exp I had the chance to make three installations in, in that festival because most of my installations are very small that you can unwrap and bring uh, in a suitcase. So I was there with three installations and uh, I was joking and say next time call it a retrospective but uh, it's... Um, so in this installation this is called flashback. It's called flashback because uh, my intention is uh, to create a relationship between a light, an ancient light, and a contemporary light. The contemporary light is what we see today uh, is as a video projection, and the previous light is a light from the, the, the past. In fact, these uh, colors that are, that are shown in this installation are coming from a painting of, of 463. It's a painting that's conserved in a, in a church in, in Tallinn. So my intention was, uh, this um, installation was a video project that was computer gen generated and was based on a picture of that painting. So my intention um, is that we have a flashback because people see uh, what they see on the wall is in fact a light from 1463. Uh, 1, this is my intention. We, here we have a sample of uh, what, uh, what was the, uh, let's see if it moves. Does it, uh, unfortunately, I don't think we see it very well now because there is a, um, anyway, as, as there is not enough, there is too much light. Anyway, what was happening that the color was changing slowly between, uh, between the colors of, of the, the, the painting. Unfortunately, I don't think we see it very well here. Let, let me try again. No. Why? How do I make this uh, start? No, a, a, any, anyway, l l let's go further. Maybe we, we, we see it l l later. So this is the, um, the original painting. It, it was a painting that was some meters long. And uh, I took a photograph of this painting. And, uh, and this was the base for my software algorithm. Uh, so the, what? Uh, why do I say that the light from uh, uh, the Middle Ages was coming back to, to light? Because I see, uh, I show you uh, in this path with these yellow, uh, yellow arrows, what, where is light and what is the path that it does in, in this process? So we have the, the sun that goes to the natural world in trees, closes of, uh, the, of people, then there is a light bouncing back from the closest and goes to the Notke, who is the painter, in the later eye, then he makes the, the painting. So uh, this is the, the process that this light goes into a painting, gets recorded into a painting. Like uh, today, we, we have other ways to record uh, the, the light we see, like with, with a camera. In that time, there was only this, uh, the, the painting. Then what happens, um, we have the sun in uh, 2015, when I made uh, my, my picture, the sun goes on the painting, light bounces back, goes in, in my camera, then it goes in the memory, then goes in the video projection, where there is an L LCD filter who filters it, and then it goes on the wall of the building, and then it goes to, to the observer. So in my intention, what we see in this long process there is light that goes back and forth in, uh, or in this path, and then is a light of uh, 1,500. So my intention is to say the painting is not just a medium of the subject, is a medium of a, a light. So this concept has also been, uh, this whole concept is also been uh, um, done in, in other works I've done, for example, Veggie, the one uh, that's on the book of uh, Gisela Gellini. And, um, and uh, that is a little bit less, uh, less long path because there is only the, the latest, the, a, sh a shorter path. 
anyway, uh, here it's, it's more complex, but I think it's, it's still valid. So just to tell you how it was uh, uh, technically done, so I had to wrap the painting in, in this way to have it in a square format. Then my algorithm was scanning the painting, just taking a small portion at a time. So it was sort of making a path, a random path in the, in the painting. And then what you see projected on the wall is just a, a, little, a little bit. So for example, you have this small part when you see, for example, the greens. And if you have this, you see the, the reds. And I think that uh, um, it, mm, yeah, it makes sense uh, to say that it's the light because those are the colors that people were re really seeing and we are seeing them again. Um, all this concept of uh, media and uh, the relationship uh, with the real thing uh, made me go back to the allegory of the cave of Plato. Plato says that there is, uh, uh, that what Mm, let's say, normal people see is just the media of uh, the true object. And uh, he uses for his um, intention to say that the, the real, uh, um, the essence of things stays uh, in, a, in a sort of uh, special place. Then um, those people who stays down here, they just see the shadow of a copy of the object. And uh, what, um, what is really interesting is that if we see it in this way, so this is a better picture, but the other one had the sun, who was also important for me because there was a light, and then, there is, then under there was a fire who is, it was an artificial light. Uh, what we have here, what Plato described, is the same thing as architecture of a video projector. So this was a really interesting uh, the thing that I discovered, that the video projector and the allegory of the cave have the same uh, structure. So there is an artificial light, there is some, some, uh, some device that modifies the, this artificial light, and then there is a screen where something related to this object uh, gets uh, projected. And so it was happened here, when there is the light source of the video projector, the LCD, LCD panel where, that modifies uh, the, the light, and then we have a screen where things uh, get projected. So uh, in this way, we, have, um, we try to understand better what is a medium. A medium, it's uh, something that uh, uh, brings something uh, that relates to the original object, as Plato say, is uh, in the world of the ideas. And, uh, but uh, media is something that stays, that want to re represent something else, something that is or original. Uh, I have done the same sort of, um, of work for v v Veggie, the, word, uh, the work that you may have already seen uh, in the book. This is, I, the, the, I took a picture of me, so you see what's the size of these works. They are more or less um, 30 centimeter by, per, per side, and uh, each one, it's, uh, they are made with LEDs, with an LED panel in the back, and there is a software that, that, made, that made the same thing that I made on the painting, but it's made on photographs. photographs. For example, the green one, as a subject, as this bro broccoli, for those, for that, um, uh, for that work, I selected specific vegetables that were recommended by Fondazione Veronesi for a healthy diet uh, that could prevent cancer. And so we had, uh, so this was an image of broccoli, and with my algorithm, I, I was going like uh, in the, in moving in the image and bringing back the light that was recorded in this, in this image. Little by little, uh, you, could, uh, you could see this light that had some shadows and so on. And uh, if we see the installation here, uh, I hope we see this video a little bit better. Yeah, maybe it is. And uh, you see all the six uh, works all together uh, where light is slowly changing, uh, taking a small detail of a picture but it's not just a detail, there is also some sort of uh, smoothing, like uh, it changes gra gradually. So this was a changing light uh, based on a media. 
on, on a real media, what we consider media today, a picture made with a camera. But, but as you can see, we, you don't see the broccoli. You don't see the uh, tomatoes or beans uh, or cabbage because I'm not interested in showing you the image. I'm interested in just showing you the light. And you will see later that I'm not the only one interested in light and not in the subject. So, uh, so the video goes on. You can also find it on my website. Most of uh, all these works you see today are, are on my website. So if something is not clear, you can go there and, uh, and look it there. Also there, everything is in English. Good or bad, that you might think. Okay, uh, now I tell you, just to understand uh, between each other, what is a medium? Or at least what I, what I think, what I consider a medium. A medium is something that represents the essence of something else and is equivalent for a certain purpose. So for example, uh, if we make a picture of uh, a, a person, we, when we see the picture, we, we recognize the person. So for us, it's the same person that is represented. And of course, uh, mm, doing this abstraction, you lose something. And, uh, but you may gain something. For example, if it's a digital picture, you can send it on the other side of the world very quickly. And so you gain something because you cannot send the person on the other side of the world. So if you make a Skype call with, with a person uh, in Australia, for example, right now, uh, it is equivalent of maybe talking to the, to the person over here. So for that thing, I see it, it equivalent. So it it equivalent for the thing you are you are you are doing like for speaking maybe you cannot touch the person so for that thing is not equivalent but for something it is in fact what uh, what happens every time we have uh, a new medium when we develop a new medium we always there are something um, there is something specific to the medium that we learn over time how to use it so for example i remember when there was television and uh, the thing that was represented in television like were the the theater plays, that was a previous sort of media. So in that way, uh, it's not easy to find the right way to use a new medium. But uh, anyway, this is uh, what media is. Of course, as, as I told you, you might, the, the, what, the important thing is that in media, you want to mediate something or something else. So it's not that every media uh, wants to mediate the same thing. For example, when I use a photograph and uh, my intention is not the subject but the light, so it's a media of light for me and maybe for something from somebody else is a media of the subject. Anyway, you must also know what you are mediating or, de or declare it, for, for example. Okay, uh, one important book that made me understand a little bit what media is, it's Ontology of Media by Mario Costa, who is an Italian philosopher. And uh, it's a small book that uh, if you read it, um, well, he's a philosopher, so sometimes he gets lost in uh, long things, but it was very important for me to think about what, what is a medium. Of course, not all light is, is the media. In this case, light is, uh, is what it is. As Flavin said, it is what it is and ain't, not, and in, uh, ain't nothing else. It means that uh, uh, this is a, it is exactly what it is. It's a pink light uh, coming from a corner. Okay. But there are some other artists who study light uh, and photography. Uh, one important artist who is a conceptual photographer He's a Jan Diebetz from the Netherlands. And uh, um, this is a, a series of photographs he made in 1970. And uh, what Diebetz says, a photograph does not reproduce an image, it records variations of, of light. This is, a sort of, is for me very inspiring because uh, it says that light, it's, uh, it's not the, the subject, the, the, the photograph is not the subject, but is, uh, it's just variations of light. Is, is up to us to recognize a subject. Of course, in his technique, he made a lot of pictures so you could see light changing over time. Uh, so what is the subject of this uh, photograph? It's not the, the window of, of the gallery where he made this, um, this picture, but it's light changing. 
He made the same day, he made four of these works in uh, four places in the world. Um, this is called The Shortest Day at Korn Fischer Gallery, because it was uh, in Germany where the gallery is. And uh, then he made one in New York, and one uh, in his home, and one in another place. And other people were taking pictures. So it means that he designed the, the work and other people, for example, maybe the one in his home, he made it, but the one in the gallery, maybe he, he didn't really press the shutter of the, of, of, of the camera. So in fact, in these type of works, what is more important is not the artist who makes it, but who designs it. Here there is a similar work where he photographs light coming from a window and, uh, where, and how it moves uh, during the day uh, in the gallery. So what we have seen that in, in photography, light is, is proportional. This is one, one important thing about uh, light in photography, that it's not absolute. What does it mean? It means that if we have a certain light bouncing on a, on a surface, because that's what, why we, we photograph, we make a picture, what we record is a proportion, as, as Dibet says, variations of light. It doesn't, it doesn't record the absolute value of light. So if you look at the picture again, you don't see the exact amount of light you are seeing in reality. This is something that a little bit uh, was interesting for me, was to try to reproduce a picture, or at least a sensation of light, that was similar to the one you had looking at something. So for example, if you have the sea in front of you, uh, you have a certain amount of light, certain color of light coming towards you. Uh, my intention is how can, I make the, how can I make a picture of this light, of this intensity, of this color? So I, I, made some, um, I made some studies that you will see later, but the important thing is that normal photography, it's not an absolute medium of light, this is a, but a relative medium. Also color reproduction is not perfect and so on. Uh, one important, one other thing that uh, maybe you, you should know by now is that you, we, we record and reproduce light with RGB, red, green and blue, like LEDs or, uh, or other lights because this is our eye works. Because in our eye we have cells that can uh, detect red, green and blue uh, length, wavelengths separately. So all this um, study also started with the variations of light and um, also the consideration that nowadays we have very powerful tools for uh, to analyze first and then to reproduce variations of light. And um, what, what do we do? We do, we do this. This is what we do in cities, except sometimes when there is a light festival that we want to do other things, but they last a week and then they go away and we have this, and we have this. This is a, I don't know, a picture that I had from, a, from Facebook, a friend who posted this and said, okay, I should bring it up to see what are cities with these powerful tools uh, to reproduce light we, we have, uh, how do, what, what do we do today? So now um, I'm starting my experiments of recording in absolute variations of, of light. So in 2010, I think, um, I made this uh, installation where I recorded the tw in the 21st of June, that, the longest day, uh, light that was, um, I recorded the intensity of light all over the day and the color of light. So I was using a lux meter connected to a computer and uh, a camera who was reading uh, the light bouncing this, uh, this cube. The cube was covered with uh, barium sulfate, who is uh, a, a very white neutral sur surface. No, yeah. Okay, and uh, here is another picture because I had to move to record the light in the other part of the day. Um, and then I reproduced the lamp, a sort of lamp, who could make the same intensity on the small cube. So my intention is to make a photograph of the intensity of light and reproduce it. So I had used uh, LED LEDs with different colors, uh, mostly white, what is called uh, uh, cold white, because that's the intensity of the, uh, that you have at midday when you have, then there are some uh, um, warm, 
uh, warm LEDs and also some blue LEDs because in my experiment I have recorded that there is a blue light. So I, my, my sensor told me that there was a blue light. It was made with Arduino. It's a, a small computer that now a lot of people use. It's very, it's very friendly. You don't need to be a computer guy to, to use it. And then I, I, I calibrated my, my lamp so the lamp was, could reproduce, I could check that it was reproducing the same amount I recorded before. This was the calibration process where if I project, I don't know, 50,000 50, looks at this color, does it really make it? Yes. This is how I really calibrated the lamp. And uh, here was the, the computer next to installation where you could choose the time of the day and in the software that was recorded the looks and the color. And the people could, uh, uh, could jump from one uh, time to another and say, let me see, let me see the real light of uh, 6 a.m. or the light of uh, midday and so on. So uh, now, of course, you don't see anything here because uh, it's, we, also, we have the, the, the problem of the, the media that's not absolute. This is one work that you have to see live, of course. Because if you see a media of this, it's really does, it's sort of nonsense. But uh, you see different uh, images of what was happening in, in the room, for, for example. And here we have a spectator of the, uh, I mean, the interactive uh, spectator of a thing who could select, uh, um, who was selected, for example, in this light, there was a very strong light, maybe midday. I remember that that day was 80,000 lux, was the, 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 the maximum. But some days I also measured 100,000 looks uh, of, uh, and it's very, it's very, um, it's very strange because our eye adapts during the day, uh, so you don't really feel uh, the difference. Of course, you know that there is more light uh, at midday than uh, at 10 a.m. But if you see it jumping quickly from one intensity to another, is an in in interesting experience. Uh, if we go back, there was, in some case, where I measured, because uh, my devices measure, a blue light. And uh, I said, okay, I measured a blue light, I should reproduce it, because I think my, my method is accurate. Um, then I discovered what was my, I made a sort of mistake, but not really. If, uh, but then going further, I discovered that some other guy was painting a blue light. You see, here we have this blue color in the shadow. And here we have a more orange color where there is uh, the sun, the direct sun. Because in fact, in this, in this uh, composition, there are at least two types of light coming from different directions. So there is a sunlight in this direction, which is more orange, and there is a blue light coming from the sky. So if you remember how I, how, we have, how I have recorded light, I had recorded on a horizontal surface. So in fact, I was just recording the horizontal light and not the, the direct sunlight. So it was, it was okay. And also I discovered that, uh, I mean, now I discovered why Monet was, was painting uh, blue, la, blue shadows because in effect they are really blue. And um, if you remember what Jan Dibet was making, he was making a lot of picture of the same thing in different times. But it's the same thing that Mo Mo Monet did. In most of his works, in some of his work, he made like a series of a lot of paintings, like 50 paintings of the same subject in different conditions. For example, uh, you see these three haystacks are a way not to paint the haystack, but to paint light. This is what, uh, what I think. And uh, for example, the very famous cathedral in uh, different times of the day, they are the painting of the cathedral, but also of, of light. Also of light that was changing. Um, with this approach, a little bit from Debets and M M Monet and from myself, because you know, when you start making a work, maybe you have a background, but you don't realize it immediately. So when I had to prepare uh, this, uh, this speech over here, I had to go back to think what I really did. So this is interesting that Gisela calls me every year so I go back and see and try to compare my works to the, the one of, of others. So for example, in 2010, I started making serial photos of different subjects where light was changing. So for example, uh, of course you can do this with digital cameras, 
with, with the time lapse option. So make a picture every minute or every 30 seconds or whatever. And for example, I made this picture on several subjects, for example, the C, you, you have some sub, and I took the, for example, here the C, I made it during sunset. So I was sure light was, was, was changing. And for example, this is a little bit when the sun was a little bit down. And then I made the composition of these images. Altogether, I just took a small slice of each picture and I composed it from left to, to right. So what you see here is just a, a very small part of picture and then goes composed from left to right, like, like this. So this is a, a time, for example, at 6 p.m. This is maybe like at 9 p.m., for, for example. It moves in this way. This is 100 minutes C, so it means I made picture for 100 minutes. Then something more uh, longer, one day horizon. It is pictures from when it's dark to when it's dark again. So you basically see an horizon over here. You see an horizon, but it's not occurring in space, it's occurring in time. And what you see here, for example, there is this uh, orange uh, light, and also you have it here. And uh, yeah, so you see a little bit the different type of uh, light, co light of uh, color of light. This is one day sky, so the same uh, thing, but on, this, on the sky itself. And here I notice one, uh, one thing, is that the subject, as it moves in front of the camera in a sort of line, it gets scanned and it gets recomposed again. So what you see is a sort of, uh, you get a little bit tricked by this, uh, by this subject because you see a sun, but because as you slice it, little by little, then you recompose it again when the time passes. Then this is a sunset in my studio. I photographed the wall of, uh, of my studio where light was coming in at sunset. So you could see um, that there is a, a color changing and position changing in, in this one. Okay, then a little bit on going back to our friend uh, Monet. Uh, one important painting is uh, Impression Soleil Levant that is uh, the, uh, the sort of uh, starting of Impressionism and um, it's a sunrise. And I, while uh, I mean, seeing things, I collected some other sunrises because I also have my sunrise, but I also, we have this of Monet, of course, but we also have the one of Bill Viola. Uh, Bill Viola uh, recorded a sunrise and uh, I took this picture on the internet, but, and the other two, I took them uh, with my phone in Villa Panza during the installation. I think I couldn't, but it's okay, they are here. So the interesting thing of this video that was lasting more or less one hour, you see what, what, what happens, that in reality, all the, he didn't calibrate the, the camera. So the camera was, was like uh, uh, set to record what we could say is a normal image when there was, it's still dark. But then while he was going towards the sunrise, it was becoming more and more clipped out and more white because the, the medium, the, the camera, could not record all the intensity. This is why I had to make, for my recording, I used a lux meter who had a, a wider intensity. Of course, in that case, it was not a recording space, but just like one pixel. I mean, a lux meter is a camera of one pixel, for, for example. If you, here, at least you have some space. And the interesting thing is this saturation where you are in the room, everything becomes white. It was, uh, it was interesting. Now a little bit on my sunrise. So this is sunrise from my view from, from my home. Let's see if I can go, if I can skip it a bit. No, I want to skip the video, but I'm not sure how I can, how I can skip the video. No, we don't see it. Uh, very well, this one, ah, maybe here we have it. Ah, okay, we have it here, now I understand. So this is a sunrise. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, it's not easy to do it from here. So this is a sunrise made in 2013, more or less in this time of the year. And uh, we go a little bit further. So you see how, this is a video made in one frame per second. So it's a, it's a time lapse, in fact. One frame per second, you can see the sun moving, 
and slowly. And, uh, and then what I did was the same technique as, more or less the same technique as before, is to compose just a line of pixel from each frame. Before I was taking a small amount, like I don't know, 50 pixels, or now I take just one line. So what you see here is instead of making a photograph in space, you make, I make it in time. So it's just a cut through time because the vertical part is still space, but the horizontal one is time. Um, if you see these bands here, you have some bands that, that you see, is because the camera was put in automatic mode because it needed it and it was adapting sometimes. Otherwise, I would have the effect of viola where everything was clipped out at a certain point. I wanted still to get a sensation of, uh, of, of, of the subject any, any, any way. And I did, the, I did this uh, for six days in a row to see what happens six days, one, one after the other. So this is, for example, the first day. This is the second day. You see, it's quite different. The third day, still a little bit different. And uh, the fourth day, and the fifth day, and the sixth day. These days, was, were, it was cloudy. So as it was cloudy, uh, we have a, a different, we have the same technique, but with the subject that what gets, out, what gets reproduced is completely different. But we still have an, an idea of light. You have these colors that you didn't have the day before, you had different, uh, you had different. But for sake of uh, making the same concept, this is the, the subject. And I've printed them as series of six, uh, of six, a series of six. Okay, now, I have done this uh, uh, technique on natural subject, but I said, what happens if I do this on artificial subjects? So, one day I started, instead of uh, watching the movie, uh, of what happens on the movie on the, on the screen, where you have uh, your uh, normal image, I recorded the opposite side of the movie. So, the back, the back of the movie, the back of the room. And uh, I recorded this, the subject still by one frame per second, and I applied this to several, uh, to several movies. And for example, this is 2001, An Odyssey in Space. So what you have is a sort of averaging of the frame you have in the, in the, in, in the movie, but it's the color of your room. So I am recording the color of the room. And it's, uh, as you see, depending on, on the movie, for example, if you know the movie, here is where the computer uh, gets a little bit, uh, gets mad and then gets deactivated. Here you have the sunrises, and, and once again in the movie, so you recognize something. You just recognize um, a, a mood. So here we have um, so one the same space, then you have Blade Runner, and uh, you see completely different uh, colors. Then there is uh, Traffic, who is a specific movie who has two types of scene: one in the desert, one in the city. So you have you recognize different patterns. And then I also tried with uh, black and white movies to see what, what happens. And uh, cartoon movies, they are much more colorful. So you have here a, um, yeah, the, the spectrum of, uh, of, of the movie. And then I also did it in something a little bit different. That's not a movie, but it's a football game. In that case, your room, if you watch it, is mostly, is mostly green. In some cases, we have white and blue shirts of the players, if, if, if you see. And then I think we also have the, 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 the break between the first and the second, uh, the break between the first time and time. Okay. Um, now, going back to a more uh, complex uh, concept, uh, it's uh, a real-time uh, um, analysis of a natural light that becomes an artificial light. So I made this installation first for uh, an exhibition created by Gisela Gellini in San Carpoforo. It's called 1000 Memories of Light. The, um, the setup here is there is um, a candle, a small candle. Then there is a, a color sensor that is a sort of one pixel camera. This is, I call it one pixel camera because you can just detect the color, so RGB. 
And there is a line of 1,000 LEDs here. One, it's like 18 meters long. What happens is that 60 times per second, I capture light and I reproduce it in the pixel next to the, to the camera. And the one that's there gets shifted ahead. So then when you see the video, you maybe understand it a little bit better. So these pictures are from the installation in Tallinn because it was a very, it's an ancient and uh, nice place uh, where people were interacting. They were moving the flame and the flame was uh, propagating this motion in space. So what was happening in time here was real time happening in space. So you have the, here the 18 meters line uh, uh, installed. And here, let's see if we can make it run now. Yeah, there is a video of what was happening. This was a video in San Carpoforo. A small video of, uh, yeah. Yeah, here there is a little bit too much light on the screen, so you don't see the details, but anyway, if you see it then on, the, on, the, on my website, you see it, uh, you see what, what happens. Yeah. So what you have here in this installation is a live light that becomes media in the computer in the small computer, it's still an Arduino, and then becomes light again. So there is a process where light, light gets captured and transformed and re becomes light again, but in a, in a different way, because what was happening in time here is happening in space. Here are all the 1,000 LEDs, the end of the 1,000 LEDs. And um, before this installation, some years before, still curated by Gisela Gellini, we, uh, she curated, an, uh, curated um, an exhibition for Luminale, that's an um, important uh, big uh, light festival in, in Frankfurt. And um, it was in, archeologi in an archeological mu museum, in that case, uh, these are, this is a picture of the, of the light devices in the ancient light devices in the museum. And uh, what I did was a, an installation who was capturing the light uh, of an oil lamp and was uh, analyzing it with the computer and then reproducing with big LEDs. So, um, my, my work, it's called light sympathy because what's happening is that in real time we had the sensation of a flame but the, powerful of, the power of LEDs. So we have this uh, sort of, uh, it's light sympathy because the two light uh, uh, vibrate to, together and one gives the, the, um, the power, the LEDs, but the personality of light is given by the, the, the flame. Here I took this installation also in Tallinn, and uh, here are some photos of the work there. But then this video is the one in Frankfurt. Here the computer analyzes the motion of the flame, and then it transmits it to the LEDs. So, and it was projected outside the window. So from outside, from the street, you could see this big uh, flame effect. Mm, it was powerful and uh, yeah, so the power of LED and the, and the mood of a flame. So also in this case, uh, there is light that becomes media, gets transformed and then becomes light again. What do we have? Yeah, okay. If you re remember, oh, okay, still back to our friend here. Uh, this is a painting he did, a subject on 18, 1897, and then the same subject like 25 years later. In what you see, there is a difference in that the subject gets a little bit dissolved over time. 
So he was not interested from the beginning, in my opinion, in the uh, subject itself, but in the mood of, uh, of the place. And uh, so this is why you see we're here, we still have a subject, even though it is a little bit more uh, <coughs> abstract, there is some abstract concept. And here it gets a little bit uh, more abstract, where you see a green uh, thing. If you don't know what is the subject, you maybe not, you don't recognize it. And uh, the fact that he was interested in uh, more in the moods, you also have it from the fact that he was also making painting very big where you could create a sort of uh, immersive environment. So going on, on this concept of uh, l sort of losing the resolution of uh, your subject, I made my installation this year for Luminale. Um, I presented my render very simply or on, on a facade of, um, of an art gallery there. Then I, I bought some these sort of big pixels. These pixels are uh, LED-based uh, the devices. And this is a better render that I did later. And we don't see it here. Uh, unfortunately, we don't see it very well because this dark thing is, um, is a wisteria plant. Wisteria plant is glicine in Italian for, because you maybe not know the English name of plants. But uh, so I was reproducing a digital Wisteria on the right. So these LEDs are in my lab when I first tested them. Then I made these panels with a laser cut, put together, and I took this picture of uh, a Wisteria, an Italian Wisteria, um, made in, in my home where we, we have one. And uh, what I did is, uh, is that I um, used the color of this uh, image, which is sort of high resolution image, taking little by little these uh, colors to make, to make this, who is a, a lower resolution image. Let's see if I can play the video. Yeah, here the video is playing. So mm, there is a, a software running who selects uh, from different pieces of the images. So, so the image is divided in 12 by 5, like uh, it is in this matrix. And um, randomly, the, each color is picked from the same position. So for example, uh, yeah, if it's uh, upper right, it gets from the upper right of the, of the image you, you, you saw before. So for example, I show you here. For example, this is a part, this is another part, and so on. So let me see if I can play the video again. Yeah, OK. And uh, it was moving sort of slowly. So it was moving. Uh, from one pixel per second to a, a little bit faster. And how do I, how do I select uh, how fast it goes? Um, I put an, um, a wind meter, an anemometer, in the installation. So when there is more wind, the pixels move more rapidly. And if it's less wind, they move less rapidly, like in a real, uh, in a real, in a real plant. Here we see the... Um, the installation in, uh, in place. Here there is the wisteria. Of course, uh, it was still uh, not uh, blooming in that period of the year because it was a little bit, uh, it was April or, or March, I don't remember, but the uh, wisteria was uh, without uh, the leaves and so on. Here, yeah, this is a picture. And yeah, this is another picture who is more, uh, it should be more clear. And here we have the two, the two things. The one that you see during the day on the left, and the one that you see inside the, during the night. The installation is still there. It was, should uh, last a week, but then the gallery wanted to keep it, and uh, it's OK for, for me, of course. Here there is a video, I think. Yeah, it is, more or less. Yeah, it's a bit flickering now, because uh, maybe because of the camera speed and so on. Anyway, it's a very smooth. Thing. Like, uh, it's not those things you see in light festival where everything moves for five minutes, then repeats again. And uh, here is an installation that can stay a lot of time because every time is different, but to make it, to see it change, you need to, to pay attention. Otherwise, this is a light and is a light that gets transposed from the Italian light of the wisteria that I made. I captured that light in a picture. 
and then I reproduce it back with these LEDs, with these big pixels. So again, the concept is that I uh, record the light because I don't, I, of course I make a picture of, uh, of the wisteria, but for me it's the light that counts, and then I reproduce it back. I have, here, here we see a little bit, over here there is the wind meter who moves and makes, uh, it goes connected to the, to the computer and that makes it uh, the, the, decide what is the speed of the, of the change. Okay, this was the last, uh, the last thing, and it was also the first because it was the, the slide of the title. Okay, I hope it was all clear. <laughs>